Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's a very happy looking group. It must be the weather outside. It's very warm and spring-like. <coughs> I'd like to welcome you to the Rockefeller Institute of Government. We are really excited today uh, about this event. Uh, my name is Jim Olatris. I'm the president of the Institute, and we are joined by a really stellar panel today. Uh, before we start, I want to thank all of the organizations who've helped sponsor this event. Uh, first, starting with the Center for Education Pipeline System Change at the Rockefeller Institute led by Nancy Zimfer, the New York State Education Department, the Center on the Development, uh, Developing Child at Harvard University, the one and only Schuyler Center. She told me to say that, Kate, or there would be consequences. <laughs> I don't know what those consequences are, but I didn't want to test the case. Uh, the Albany Promise, and as well as the Zero to Three organization. And uh, today we're here to dive into how we can create an infrastructure to maximize a child's development in the first thousand days. So we as a society can put every child on a path towards success. Sounds easy, but it's probably a little more complicated than that, but we have the right panelists to do just that. And so I can think of uh, no better group of people to explore this topic uh, than the one we have here today. First, we're joined by Jason Helgerson, the director of the New York State Medicaid program and like 20 other titles, which I'm not gonna go through. Jason and his team have done award-winning work on providing better care while bending the cost curve, something that is not easy to do, but they've done it. I had the honor of bringing Jason here from Wisconsin in 2010. You personally, Jim? Personally. <laughs> and it was one of the best decisions the governor has ever made. Uh, so we're happy to have him here for a little while longer. Jason would tell you he came to Albany to avoid the harsh Wisconsin winters, but I'm not so sure that's the case. To uh, his left is the commissioner of the State Education Department, Mary Ellen Ilya, who literally oversees a network of diverse schools larger than the total populations of 21 states. So it's not an easy job that she has, and she travels all over. She is a native Western New Yorker, and she spent many years at the super, as superintendent of the schools of Hillborough County in Florida, so we're happy to have Mary Ellen back at the helm in New York State. We're also happy to be joined today by Dr. Rahil Briggs, the National Director of Healthy Steps, where she's responsible for running the organization as well as acting as their chief spokesperson which must get a little complicated if the person running the place got into some trouble and how do you get out of that as a spokesperson? Speak your way out. Speak your way out of it. And look in the mirror. And look in the mirror, that's right. <laughs> she uh, also is the founding, uh, founder and director of the Pediatric Behavioral Health Services at Montefiore where she still serves, so she has many hats as well and she, we're really happy to have her here today too. And last but certainly not least, we're joined by Dr. Jack Shonkoff, Dr. Shankoff is the Julius B. Richmond Farmery Professor of Child Health and Development at Harvard University. That is a very short title. Um, Dr. Shankoff's work is internationally recognized, and he has won numerous awards and honors, including being elected to the National Academy of Medicine. Like many on this panel, Dr. Shankoff has New York roots, complete, uh, completing his undergraduate studies at Cornell University, his medical education at NYU, and uh, his pediatric training at the Bronx Municipal Hospital. People say Jack still has a little of that Bronx accent left in him, in him from his time, and he's born in Brooklyn. So now he has, compete, he has a competing accent, and we're we'll gonna see if there's any of that Boston accent in him now too. Before I call up uh, Dr. Shankoff to present, uh, we're gonna work today where he's going to make a presentation, then we're gonna turn it over to our panelists, and then we're gonna hear from our panelists and we'd like to hear from you as well. So with no further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Sean Koff up and the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, I'm, um, I'm taking my phone out not because I'm gonna look at my messages but to watch the time because I know I have um, 20 minutes to give you an overview of the science of early childhood and brain development and how it relates to learning and health and um, what impact this might have in terms of thinking about cross-sectoral work. So that's a big task, but I'm going to give it a shot. And then I'm kind of really looking forward to the, to the discussion. So this will be really abbreviated. I know some of you know a lot about this work and some of you may just know a little, but I hope I can create a common foundation for conversation. So. Oh, you know what, I forgot to turn the mic on, sorry. 
Can you hear me? You all hear me all right? Okay. Um, so um, I'm going to summarize um, a revolution in biology that's going on right now in one slide um, and basically synthesize this into three principles for you to think about that how to understand um, what's going on in the first 1,000 days, if I can use that uh, frame, but um, this starts before the first 1,000 days starts and it continues after. But um, basically, what do we understand about the foundations, the building blocks of healthy development? And the, the one point I want you to take from the beginning and carry through the presentation and the discussion is there's only one science of early development. It's the science for early learning. It's the science for physical and mental health. It's the science for ultimate economic productivity and adaptive behavior. It's really how our brains and our bodies uh, develop and build a strong foundation early on. And there are three principles here. And um, they'll, sound, uh, they'll sound pretty regular and, um, and pretty every day, uh, but just, um, it's hard for me to say, take my word for it. I'll give you a couple of slides to back it up. That there's a lot of very rich and complicated science under this. And the beauty of working with neuroscientists is if you ask them about any of this, they say, oh, God, we're just scratching the surface. We barely understand anything about how the brain works. But if you kind of keep them locked in a room and say, OK, I get that. But um, what can you say that that's ready for prime time, that is true and that can have relevance in the real world, and they have a lot to say about that, things they all agree on, which is rare among scientists. So I'm going to tell you what they all agree on. And the first is that responsive relationships early in life and positive experiences literally shape the architecture of the developing brain. And when the environment is consistent and stable and responsive, uh, it builds a kind of sturdy foundation of brain circuitry and brain architecture, but also affects other organ systems in the body that I'll tell you about in a second. So your first, there'll be three, what I want you to take from these three principles is there are three buzzwords for you to think about. Every policy, every program that has anything to do with young children and families, you ask yourself for each one in this case, so how is it supporting and building responsive relationships between adults and young children? It starts in the family, but it includes people who work in programs, it includes extended family members. That's principle number one. The second principle is that toxic stress disrupts the process of development. Um, it disrupts the development of brain circuits as they're being formed. It affects the immune system. It affects metabolic regulatory systems. It affects the, uh, the cardiovascular system. All of these systems are influenced by what we call toxic stress, which is not just regular old stress. It's not everyday stress. It's constant, continuous activation of the stress response system week after week, month after month. It's the regular experience that children have who are in environments that are consistently seen as threatening or neglecting and kind of unresponsive. Remember, it's the responsive relationships that the brain is expecting to get. And when it doesn't get that, it signals danger. And it, your heart rate goes up, and your blood pressure goes up, and your stress hormones go up, and your inflammatory system is activated, all of which is in the service of dealing with threat which is great in an acute situation. This is the fight or flight phenomenon. But it's not good as a, as a, a person in Kansas said several years ago when we were working in there. You know, that sounds like a, an adrenaline high 24-7. That can't be good for you. And yes, it's not good for you. And it's particularly not good for you when your brain and other organs are developing. Um, and these have lifelong consequences, which I'll show you in a second, can have lifelong consequences. These are probabilities. It's not true for every single child. It's on a population basis. The third principle is that the foundations of resilience, which people are more and more talking about. Stop talking to me about all the things that go wrong. Stop talking to me about vulnerable populations. Let's focus on strengths. Let's focus on building resilience. Yes, science has a lot to say about that. And uh, at least in the 30-second summary of what science has to say is that resilience is neither something you're born with that doesn't change, nor is it something you can will yourself to do by your, on your own. So you can't look at a child in school who has overcome amazing odds and is, is doing beautifully and say to the child next to him, be like that child, you know, suck it up. Just life is tough, but suck it up. You can will yourself 
to be resilient? No. You can't will yourself to be resilient. It comes from a supportive environment that helps you build the capacities that go into resilience. And a lot of that has to do with the skills that everybody needs to have who leads a successful life of dealing with stress and hardship at a variety of levels because there is no such thing as a stress-free life. So the skills that you need, the foundational skills start early in life. They don't come in on an automatic pilot. It's not like sitting and crawling. They have to be taught, they have to be molded, they have to be shaped, they have to be practiced. So positive relationships, that's what you need. Toxic stress, that's what you need to be protected from. Core skills, that's what you need to build. That's, that's your kind of three minute summary of what science has to say about what creates healthy brains, what creates healthy cardiovascular systems, what creates healthy immune systems. Because it's not just about the achievement gap in school, it's about disparities related to income and education and racism and other forms of marginalization that produce differential likelihood of not only succeeding in school, but whether you're going to have heart disease, whether you're going to have diabetes, and whether you're going to live a long life or die prematurely. It's not, there's an element of fate, there's an element of kind of what you do to, to live a more healthy lifestyle, but there's also an element of biology that is affected early in life, and um, it actually begins before birth. But that's for another panel at another time. Uh, so just very quickly, um, I'm going to show you data from two studies that kind of make some of these core points. These data that I'm going to show you are taken from a study of children in the child welfare system at three years of age, a national sample across every state. Three-year-olds in active cases of uh, child protective services, the question is, what about the number of risk factors in the life of a child above and beyond just abuse and neglect, which is enough, but there is the usual list of other factors that increase the likelihood for poor outcomes. So what happens as the number of risk factors increases, what do we see in standardized developmental tests at age three? This is the kind of the prelude to will you need special help in school or will you come to kindergarten ready to succeed? And what we find is that one or two or three risk factors, the bottom doesn't fall out, we're not that vulnerable. If we were, we would be like dinosaurs. We would not have survived through eons of evolution. But we're not invincible. So as the number of risk factors increases, the likelihood of failing a developmental test, a standard test at age three, goes up. So that by the time you're at six or seven risk factors, essentially 90 to 100 percent of children at that age are failing a developmental test. Two points to know about this. It's not just their social and emotional development that is affected. It's their cognitive development, their language development. All of these things are interrelated. Even more important, this is preventable. This is not inevitable. This was not built into the genes. This was not foreordained at the time of birth. This is the result of comb various combinations of excessive stress activation, uh, inadequate availability of responsive protective relationships, and the, uh, and the lack of ability to be building the skills that help you deal with adversity. And we start to see those signs early. If I may make an editorial comment, even before pre-K for four-year-olds, right, already, and it doesn't suddenly happen at your third birthday, it's building up over time, and it's preventable. So we're going to go to the other side of the world, New Zealand, a small city called Dunedin, where a birth cohort study was begun about 40 years ago. Every pregnant woman in Dunedin was asked to participate in a longitudinal study. They're in New Zealand, so most people agree. They didn't ask, suspicious as the government prying into my life. They said, sure, I'll participate. And so it's about 11, 1,200 people who have been found from the time they were, before they were born. And uh, then after they were born, data had been collected over a lifetime. This is not asking people to remember. It's gathering data in real time. I'll show you data age 32, 32 years for individuals who have studied since they were fetuses and measured um, something in the blood called C-reactive protein, which is a measure of inflammation. It's been associated with an increased risk for heart disease. Think of it as a, a kind of like cholesterol level. It doesn't mean you have heart disease, but it means that if it's elevated, you're statistically at greater risk. Not everybody who has an elevation gets heart disease. It's a risk factor. So what did they find in about 11, 1,200, 32-year-olds? Well, they found about 15 to 20 percent of people with a, no health problems, an uneventful life history, had elevated C-reactive proteins, kind of genetic variation. 
Individuals who had a diagnosis of depression at age 32 had a higher uh, level of C-reactive protein. That's been was known then. It's been known in many studies since. Infl depression is associated with increased inflammation. Uh, nobody totally understands why, but it's there. Um, this was a relatively early finding, not expected, but been replicated many times. 32-year-olds who had a documented history of having been maltreated as children at higher C-reactive protein levels than people with depression. And 32-year-olds who had both a history, a documented history of maltreatment and current depression, age 32, two out of five had an elevated C-reactive protein. What's the message? If you're a scientist, you say it's just one study. <laughs> Let's not get too excited about that. But after you start to see lots and lots of studies that say the same thing, if you're a scientist, you say, well, that's interesting, but we don't really understand what's going on at the molecular level. So we have to study that more. But even the scientists will agree, even though they say there's more to study, that there's a there there. There's something, there's something about early maltreatment that creates biological changes that persist into adulthood, even in the absence of continuing maltreatment. Now, recognize that's two out of five. It means that three out of five with that history did not have elevated C-reactive protein, right? And it doesn't mean everybody with an activated C-reactive protein well, level is going to have heart disease, but we're talking about relative risk. And this is one of the most important things that I want to leave you with, is that when we talk about relative risk in a population, we're not talking about individuals doesn't mean that we're talking about, on average, this is how we look at a population, because there's a lot of variability. So um, what does this have to do with health? You know, I mean, we've, we've been talking for 50 years about what this has to do with school readiness. Let's talk a little bit about what this has to do with health. So these data are a little bit old, but they haven't changed. Maybe the numbers have changed with the cost of health care, but the relationships are the same. Here are the most expensive diseases that we treat in this country. The number one is heart disease kind of throw various forms of cancer in there is the next highest in terms of number two, um, some of which are really associated with adversity, but not as strongly as heart disease. Then we get to mental disorders, largely depression and anxiety disorders, diabetes, hypertension. Every one of these disorders is more prevalent among individuals. There's a social class gradient, social determinants health are prevalent here. More poor people have these diseases, more people of color have these diseases. Um, there's always a genetic component to everything, but it's the environmental influence on genetics that always kind of uh, determines a lot of the outcomes. So um, again, there isn't much time to go into details this morning. Maybe we'll talk about it in the conversation. But we have the science is screaming at us, if we're willing to listen, that what happens early on is not just about school readiness, and it's not just about third grade reading scores, and it's not just about high school graduation. And we should say, by the way, that high school graduation, which we still talk about, as kind of the goal for this. Uh, that was a good goal 20 years ago. High school graduation isn't good enough anymore to kind of get you a job. You need even more education than that. But it's to say that actually, um, with all the celebration we have about the money we could save in incarceration, which is the most expensive outcome of not attending to early childhood, until we start paying attention to health. And then incarceration actually doesn't look that expensive. Heart disease looks more expensive than incarceration. So there's a lot to be said here. And this is, I know it's a big issue for, for those of you involved in the 1,000 Days campaign, that this is a cross-sectoral issue. Everybody's budget will benefit from this. Um, and uh, whether some of the money is paid for out of health or education or whatever, there's going to be a lot of savings in the criminal justice system, but also in the healthcare system and in economic productivity. You know, it kind of goes on and on. So um, we have to stop thinking about early childhood as just about school readiness. Without taking away from its importance, it's critical for school readiness, it's just as important for lifelong health, and, and that's a big budget buster. You could do the arithmetic. What if effective early childhood programs decrease the rate of the prevalence of heart disease by 2% in the adult population. That's not a very big impact. It's a lot of money of how much we pay for heart disease. And it's only going to get more expensive. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now with just kind of a, and again, I, it, the, well, I'll tell you at the end where you can get more information. So if we look at 21st century science, I'm good. Um, it really, until recently, we have been using the brain science to make the case very effectively for why investing in early childhood is important. It's absolutely a, it's a no-brainer, no if you pardon the expression. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, we don't have to study anymore whether we can make a difference. 
And the science just kind of backs that up. But if we just keep using the science to say, this is why it's important, this is why it's important, we're kind of standing on the wayside, missing the opportunity, which is how can we use the science to have a bigger impact? How can we use the science to generate new ideas and to measure the impact of what we're doing? So I will just give you the take home messages about some of the new ways of thinking in the early childhood world that the science is basically saying, this is what you should be thinking about. So the first is that greater attention has to be focused on the prenatal period and the first two years after birth. And the reason I say two years is because I said birth to three or prenatal to three, everybody say, yeah, yeah, prenatal to three. And if I say prenatal to two, you say, why did you say two and not three? And um, maybe you can ask about that during the discussion. <laughs> um, the second issue is that early experiences affect lifelong health, not just learning. We have got to get this out of a siloed approach just to school readiness. And the third is that healthy development requires protection for the developing brain, not just enrichment for the developing mind. Because if we have high quality programs with rich learning opportunities and everybody's talking to kids and reading to the kids, but if the brain circuits that help you pay attention and control your impulses have been disrupted, you don't need more enrichment. You need protection to kind of build the sturdy circuits that will allow you to benefit from good quality programs. So all of this led us a couple of years ago as we were starting to think about what could we do differently in early childhood to come to a realization that over time has stood up well, which is we have to stop focusing just on the children. We have to start paying attention to the adults who are caring for children. That is the big frontier in early childhood. For people who've been in the field, it's like, oh yeah, of course, you know, two generations and all that stuff. But, but let me be a little bit more specific. Um, so if we want lot bigger outcomes for children, better, uh, more advances in learning, in physical health, and mental health, we're going to have to figure out how to support the adults who care for them to transform their own lives if they are living in poverty and dealing with substance abuse and dealing with violence and dealing with depression. The answer is not just to encourage people in those circumstances to not forget to read to their children and talk to their children. We have to help them transform their lives because those factors are influencing their children's well-being and they're interfering with, with parents' desire to give their ch children everything their children need but are blocked by day-to-day -day survival issues. So issues around workforce development and mental health for adults are a critical part of where early childhood is going to have a breakthrough, not just what are we doing for the children when they're dropped off at a program. Um, and there's also the issue of the community. We cannot just have the answer be we build the capacity of parents to deal with the sources of stress in their communities if those stresses are overwhelming and they're preventable, right? So there's a, this is the science is helping us understand the community dimension. And also when we talk about adult capacities, we're not just talking about parents and caregivers in the home. We're talking about teachers and staff in early childhood programs and child care providers who in many cases are undertrained and underpaid and have their own high levels of depression and eligibility for programs for economically insecure families, and that is not good for the kids. Okay, so this is this has to be, this again is getting to this cross-sectoral approach. This can't all be solved in a home visiting program or an early child care center, independent of what we're doing to meet adults' needs. Um, so I'm going to leave you with one, there are several major scientific themes that are looking us in the face. Um, one of them is about timing and critical periods. I'm not going to talk about that. Another is about measures, new measures. That will be very important. But the one I'm going to leave you with is the issue of variation and individual differences. So we have, from, for 50 years, from the early, you know, the Great Society War on Poverty programs, we've always said there's no one size fits all. But we haven't really known, no, we haven't really have known what to do with that. So 21st century science is saying it is all about variation. So this is, the this is taken from a population study in Canada. It's a classic you know, relationship between SES, in this case it's vocabulary. I mean, no matter what you study, it's like higher SES on average does better and lower SES on average. But the average is really missing the point. If you see all these dots, that's all the individual data points. It's the variability that's the story. It's not the average that's the story. There are a lot of kids in low-income families who have better vocabularies than some kids in high-income families, and vice versa. It's on average it plays out. So if we take this notion of, of, of variability and really get to the heart of what the science is telling us, um, I'm going to leave you 
with the fact that we need to rethink our definition of evidence-based programs. I mean, everybody is now resonating to the need for evidence-based programs. Who could argue with that, right? It's important. Um, there's no opposition. There's no organized movement to turn, to, to turn away from evidence-based programs and use non-evidence-based programs. But our definition of evidence is deeply flawed in the face of 21st century science, because this is the way it works. So this is an imaginary study. The red line is no effect. And the, all the dots are let's, representing individual scores for individual kids or families in an intervention. And the way it works is that we, we do a statistical analysis. And if the average effect on all of the people who've gotten the intervention um, is greater than zero and it reaches a level of statistical significance, congratulations, you are now an evidence-based program. Okay? It doesn't matter if, if you have another study and you don't find the same thing, it doesn't matter. If you do 20 studies and three of them show an impact and 17 don't, it doesn't matter. You're an evidence-based program. You've shown a significant difference. Um, what we should be doing is we should be asking a different set of questions. Why did it work so well for these kids? Why did it work so poorly for those kids? Everybody who works in programs knows that. You know the families who are doing remarkably well, and you know the families and the kids where you just wish you had some new ideas. And in fact, often those families stop coming. Um, and after a while, we stop trying to reach out to them because it's frustrating on both ends. But if we, if we started to look, what science is telling us is it's the variability, not the average that means anything. So once we figure out what's working for whom, we could start scaling at a population level for the kids for whom an intervention is making a big difference. And we could stop scaling that same thing for people for whom it's not making a difference and figure out what to do differently. That requires an alliance among policymakers and practitioners and researchers and philanthropists to create an environment that demands better outcomes by allowing a more differentiated approach and not just asking people to find some study someplace that shows one positive impact and then we'll leave you alone. Okay. Um, and the, at the end, what we need is a suite of programs, a portfolio of programs and policies across sectors, not in any one domain, that together will help us match, based on individual needs of families and children, what works best, building on people's strengths and addressing what their needs are. So if you're interested in any of this and you want more information, here's our website. I'm not, we don't make any money off this website. I'm not pitching the website. But we have, we have over the years, created a lot of materials to explain very complicated science in a way that's um, accessible for policymakers and practitioners. If you want to learn more about this stuff, I invite you to go on the website. And um, thank you for inviting me to this session. They do offer timeshares, too, so don't be fooled. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Dr. Shankoff. That was really great. And we thought this was a random assortment of people, but we brought the actual cross-section of places in order to have this conversation. So first, I'd like to turn it over to Jason Helgerson, who runs the state's Medicaid program, for his reaction. And then we'll kind of go down the line and then hopefully open it up to a, a conversation. So Jason. Sounds good. Well, thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's an honor to follow Jack. And, and Jack and I actually had a chance to talk a little bit. So I got a little preview before uh, the presentation. Um, so uh, I guess my response to, the, to, to, to Jack's work and, and to what he talked about today is just a couple of things. First and foremost, particularly for those of us in the healthcare world, um, uh, while we may have thought that, uh, that uh, investments and focus on uh, children during their first 1,000 days or actually going all the way back to pregnancy was important before, uh, if anything, we should uh, feel that it's even more important uh, now in the, in the face of all the, of the emerging science. The fact that not only are we talking about the importance of, of these uh, uh, strategies and, and being effective during those early years in terms of things like school readiness, which is one of the most predictive uh, statistics when it comes to lifetime success and lifetime earnings, success in, in, in movement on to post-secondary schooling, but um, it is also obviously a, a very powerful predictor of the overall health and well-being of the individual, um, and that directly leads to the costs that we as society will incur for in helping to ensure that those individuals have access to the best treatment for their health care uh, challenges, which, um, uh, as the science suggests, uh, starts very, very early on. 
The second thing is that um, uh, I, my reaction is, is it just reinforces the strong feeling I've ha I have that the need for cross-sector uh, collaboration uh, and the need for cross-sector approaches. Uh, I come at this as someone who, in a previous life, uh, was very focused on K-12 education, was very focused on early childhood education, uh, and then went on to eventually become a Medicaid director. Uh, I should have come to this uh, realization many years ago um, of, of just how important it is, particularly for uh, uh, young children and their families, how essential it is that we think cross-sector, we collaborate uh, in meaningful ways, that at the end of the day, um, if we don't, we're not going to be successful. And I, I think that uh, any challenge, any policy, any social policy challenge that you can imagine, um, uh, when, when we fail to make progress in those areas, it's usually for uh, one of two reasons, uh, or uh, for both of those reasons are, are relevant, either because it's complex, or secondly, because no single sector is actually fundamentally responsible for it, meaning that there is no sort of um, uh, one place to go for accountability, um, and you have both those factors in the case of young children. At the end of the day, it is an ultimate cross-section of, of so many different, whether it's education, healthcare, uh, criminal and, and juvenile justice, um, uh, child care, you, you, know, you name it, um, you bump into all these different sectors. Um, and uh, the statistics, the overall statistics, uh, suggest that we flat out aren't, as a society, doing a very good job. And far too many children are falling through the cracks and aren't getting uh, the kind of, uh, of nurturing environment and support that they need to develop effectively. And we all ultimately pay the price for that in addition to the, the individuals directly impacted. So we definitely need to think cross-sector. Last thing I'd say is that uh, to play off um, of, I think one of Jack's most powerful points is this idea that um, we oftentimes in this space um, uh, like to say, well, if all government did was spend more money on evidence-based programs, the world, in fact, would be a better place. I've heard many people come into my office or heard many people advocate for the legislature. If only we had more home visiting programs, if only we had more of this and more of that, we would solve all the world's problems because the evidence base for that program is, is so clear. So let's spend a half a billion dollars on this or a billion dollars on that. And I think what Jack's analysis shows is that the world is actually more complex than that. We have a lot of programs out there and a lot of things that are going on right now to, in essence, support or provide services to these young children and their families. And frankly, folks, we just got to do a better job of making sure the things that are out there work and that we actually work together better cross-sector. We have to get much more creative. I mean, in some ways, it feels like precision medicine is really well, uh, uh, more of a precision approach to me and the needs because the situation, the problem is far more complex. This is not something that a one size fits all brand new government program is going to solve. Uh, it's going to require a lot of creativity and a creativity on a very local level to figure out what the needs are of these children and families, what programs can be tailored to their unique needs. As Jack said, it's almost a suite of different options um, uh, uh, need to be, in essence, uh, looked at and pursued. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is I think we need to focus uh, a lot more of our effort on outcomes. I think part of the problem in this is an un willingness um, in this area to accept the fact that we're not getting the outcomes that we need uh, and we haven't been getting it despite a lot of efforts over decades of time and focus. Um, we, um, even before Jack and the science, there was a lot of research that suggested from very prominent economists uh, who had said um, uh, that uh, other government programs didn't work, said, you know, investments in early childhood did. Uh, and while we have made investments, uh, we've expanded pre-K, we have uh, a lot of government uh, subsidized child care, we have done a number of different things, we still are not seeing the kind of outcomes that we should need. Far too many children continue to fall through the cracks. I just think if we can focus less on stuff and more on outcomes, hold people like me, hold our elected officials accountable for those outcomes, I think we'll get better, more creative, more focused solutions. We'll utilize the programs that exist better, uh, that already exist more effectively. We'll force cross-sector collaborations and discussions in communities all across the state and across the country. I think at the end of the day, that's really where we need to focus our time on, is, is to say, at the end of the day, to politicians and others, it's not simply enough money, enough interest. It's simply not enough to put more money into some new... With, with health care, we spend a lot of time doing quality improvement. 
And I've really seen differences in small change and quality improvement, which includes measurement. That needs to be more infused in early childhood, where programs look at their daily outcomes and their, and their improvement. And I would really suggest that's a technique that can really move the field. All right. Yeah, we've seen great success with uh, um, high utilizers of the emergency room. We have deployed rapid continuous improvement uh, in, I don't know, Kalen, how many different ERs? Like 70 different ERs across the state and pretty much across the board. Uh, and that's a classic example of, I mean, rapid side continuous improvement lean is not new to healthcare. It's been applied, but usually it's applied for how do we make the OR more efficient so we can put more people through it faster and make more money. This is basically, these are individuals who have very complex needs that you need to integrate into your approach, not just what happens in the ER, but what happens outside in the community and how you can make referrals to other com home community services. I think that kind of thinking can be applied in a number of different settings, um, and it would, and it's great as a local strategy because I, I'm a big believer in, in, the, in the Albany Prom Promise Project that we've been rolling our sleeves up in you see just how complex the system is for families. Mm -hmm. I mean, our, and I have been just completely sobered by the process map for how you identify a child, refer them to the county, they get assessed, then you know the, the, all the steps, and then you think about that through the eyes of a single parent who works two jobs, neither of which gives her the opportunity to take time away from her job to take care of her child, and all the other challenges and issues going on in that life, and we're shocked when in the outcome in Albany County is 65% of the children in the EI system are white, and yet the school system, the, the largest school system in the city is 83, 84% um, mostly African American minority. And you know, I, to me it's like, and that outcome has been that outcome for a long, long time. And I think we gotta start asking a lot of questions locally and at a state level about why that outcome is tolerable and what we can do to fix those processes. And we're working with the pediatricians now to try to f figure out ways to get that. But I think there's a, there's tons of that stuff out there that things like rapid cycle continuous improvement could help us fix. Question right here. Question. Um, where did it come from? I've recently had the opportunity to do a research into the literature on abuse and neglect prevention, and which I feel really fits into what you're talking about in starting with prenatal zero to two. Um, I did not find much in the literature on how to do that at the local community level or how to deal with it at the state level in a state local partnership over this. Um, I would say I only came up with a couple of resources that talk about the promising approach to having small scale uh, collaboratives that would include the welfare department and the child care, et cetera, all the things that you've mentioned, promising. I mean, we need actual examples of this working and then those folks um, cascading it out to everybody. Because everyone and their brother and sister is gonna to wanna to start up a local collaborative. It's very difficult um, and also it is very different than a community-wide initiative. And so we need to be specifying that we need a local collaborative and how that is different from a community-wide initiative. Thank you. Thank you. We have a couple of questions in the back. Any answers? Well, I would just say you're absolutely right. I mean, it's hard to start these. It's hard to maintain them. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the one of the challenges. Are I mean, the, Mary Ellen talked about the the challenge of cross sector. Everyone gets so busy, uh, and cross sector by its nature requires each sector to be willing to give up power, control, uh, time. time, and all those things. But I think at the end of the day, that is our our, our societal challenge: is how do we get as you say so eloquently, get over our adult selves um, and, uh, and be willing to, to, to do that. So I do think some of the things that, that we're doing with um, community schools yeah. can support that, but you're talking, I think, much earlier, and that's where we are not, in, in the education world, 
um, we see, if we get three-year-olds, we get three-year-olds. And we have not connected with what's happened before that child walked in. And that's the reality. So, um, so it's really got to be something that the community is willing to put that collaborative together and then listen and work with them to make it work. So you, you put your finger on a very important other dimension about um, some incentives that are missing in our field that exist in every field where innovation happens all the time. So whether it's Silicon Valley or biomedical technology parks, they thrive on learning from failure. Mm. And they, they make it safe to try things and fail with a lot of protections. I, I mean, when you get into our field, you can't talk too much about, let's just try a lot of things and take risks. People say, yeah, but we're talking about kids and families. You can't do that. But if, if, if there's no culture and a landscape that says, we expect multiple failures before we get to a breakthrough, then you never get to a breakthrough. And where in the literature, I mean, you put your finger on another big problem. Of all the years that we have been doing this, where is the body of knowledge about things that we've learned from what didn't work? It doesn't exist, right? No papers are published about things that don't work. We don't have meetings where people get up and make presentations about things they did that <laughs> failed. But in, the, in Silicon Valley, they don't do it anymore because it's so old hat. They would have conferences all the time, people talking about the big failures. Of course, it was the people with the big successes who talked about their early <laughs> failures. But, but that's a big problem. And this is where philanthropy is, is guilty of this. The public sector is guilty of this. The training programs are guilty of this. Nobody underscores the importance of making it safe to be open about something that didn't work and use that as a learning opportunity. We have no cumulative knowledge about that. That's on the implementation side. Thank you. Thanks for coming and thanks for your presentation. I have a couple of um, words that I'm going to throw out and then I'm going to try to figure out how, what's happening and how will we know in, uh, in the ground, the people on the ground, how will we know that what you're saying at the top is gonna actually be effective when it trickles down to the communities that are actually doing the work. So one of the things I didn't hear a lot about um, around HIPAA, what's being done to make sure people are actually willing and able to share information without we, I know that we spent a lot of time sitting in a group talking about these issues, pediatricians, and how do we get to them, and there are major issues around who can talk to whom, right? So that's one. Then um, training. I hear a lot of conversation around now community schools, and like most everything else, the states puts out stuff without significant training around how it should it be done. So we have school systems that are labeling people and hiring people to do community schools that are not necessarily <coughs> trained for, so, so that everybody knows what that looks like and what does it mean and how do you interact with parents and get things moving. And my biggest one of all is Diversity, I don't see enough um, representation of the people that are affected. And I'm wondering what's the state doing on that level to make sure people of color, people um, the, of second language are integrated into the collective communication and the collective discussion around what's needed and what's working um, and how those people are actual, for the people that's on the ground connecting with those people, how do we get them in the room to make sure the conversations are not just from the theoretical level, but from the practical and how we're serving people. So those are the um, issues. And I, I really would like to know how do we get overall community buying when, when the lack diversity in the population that are doing the research versus those that are actually doing the work. Thanks. Very good set of questions. So I can start on HIPAA. Um, so uh, I, we have spent an amazing amount of time in, in, in district work around this issue of how do we stay compliant with the federal law relative to information sharing and making sure that individuals who have access to it can protect it and that they are using it for appropriate reasons. Um, and that is, has been a, and it remains still very much a challenge. To give you a flavor for the how we've had to do this, we have mailed out millions of letters to Medicaid recipients notifying them that this thing called DISHRP exists, that they are part of one of these things called a performing provider system, 
and that if they call us back, we will make sure that information will not be shared um, to support the improvement of their health and well-being of their community. Uh, but if otherwise, if they do not uh, call us, we will uh, give uh, the ability of organizations within that group to be able to share information. Uh, we had to go that because in order to comply with HIPAA, that was one of the requirements that we had to do. Um, and all these organizations have had to meet state and federal requirements for how they could receive data from multiple sources and be able to share it and use it. And I think that is one of the key challenges here. And I, I, I think that you, where you get to, it relates also to this point about um, having a culturally, linguistically uh, appropriate workforce is that um, one of our collective challenges in, in district, and I think more broadly in all of this work in terms of thinking cross-sector, is that our model in our thought is not to build sort of monolithic systems where everyone goes to work for one employer. Um, there are large systems, Montefiore is a good example of that, who are very progressive who do that. But the vast majority of people who are receiving care out there in the universe, who receive services out there in the state, are receiving it from multiple different organizations who are not legally bound to each other. And so what we have to overcome is the challenges associated with those organizations actually working together as a team, being able to share information in ways. And I think it's it's essential for two reasons. One, that's how people get care today. And secondly is, is that there's a major fear out there, and I agree with this fear, that if we aren't able to solve this, I mean, the, the solution is maybe we just merge everyone into these model, big monolithic organizations. I think if we did that, we would lose the diversity. We would lose uh, even more so than there is today. We'd lose cultural and linguistic competence. We'd lose the connection that many community-based organizations had to their community that no hospital system could ever replicate. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we have to figure out ways to do that. And those HIPAA requirements are a challenge. I think at some point, frankly, we as a society have to have a different conversation about information sharing um, and health, particularly health information sharing or behavioral health information sharing than we've had been willing to have. A lot of HIPAA laws were signed, you know, law going back into the 90s, um, you know, where the early days of the internet we have advanced, there is, people are sharing information in, in many ways. Our information is out there. We, almost everyone in, in the United States has a digital imprint out there. It's, so as a result, I think that uh, you know, we run a risk uh, that on the high altar of protecting data and information, we make it more difficult for uh, organizations to work together. And ultimately, at the end of the day, my fear is the vulnerable in our society who are the ones who are victimized the most. For those of us who are healthy or wealthy, we can navigate the system. We can find our way to providers. We have the social networks. We have the time. We have the jobs, the income that give us the ability to find out where we need to go for ourselves or our families. But the poor and the vulnerable, they don't have those assets. They don't have those resources. And so as a result, things like HIPAA can be a major impediment to them getting the coordinated care. We've got to find a way. And I think at some point, a national discussion on that topic. In the meantime, you know, it's something where we have to constantly be, be focused on. So I don't know. School. No, I, I think one of the other things that came up in, in discussions that we've had relating to our community schools is how do we as agencies that come in, and those agencies are selected. We have guidance that went out from State Ed on, on the various models and the ways that you can kind of design your community school to meet the requirements or the needs of the families in your school. And so um, you, you very often will see different models. Uh, New York City has a number of different models that they've used. And all of the work that we've done is stressing the importance of having community members and, and parents from those schools involved in it. And I see you shaking your head, and I would agree that there are issues with getting that to occur in each of the schools. Um, but we're putting more and more emphasis on that as we roll out the equity issues in our new ESSA plan, which is our federal accountability plan in New York. So it's not where it needs to be. The beginning of this is that, that there needs to be community involvement in the decision making on how, that, um, how the community school is reflective of the needs of those families that are part of that school. So 
it's a work that is in progress, if you will, and more and more emphasis is on how we can make sure that uh, families are connected to and are being provided what they need, not just what a school administrator may think they need. But I would, I would get back to the issues that, um, that Jason mentioned because if you really had a school um, community work being done and it had involvement with the healthcare system, and we have a couple examples. Um, we've been, I've been to Rochester where they really have started some of this work so that um, families can make the, uh, can be progressive on saying, yes, I, I'm willing to have the data about my child and my family shared so we can get access to resources and make that work. That partnership is a difficult one to get together because they all have to do MOUs and they have to agree to all of this. But once that gets done, then it does um, allow for a lot more connection than we've had in the past. But we do have a long way to go on getting through some of those requirements that are, um, that are setting up barriers that we all think should, should be cracked and broken down, but we're in a position where we really have to deal with it in many ways. Well, we we could go with many questions, but I was promised I would do a hard stop at noon. Let's give our panelists a big round of applause. There's a lot more information. We're going to be posting a lot of the information, and if Dr. Shankoff would let us, we're going to post this presentation on our website and have other information. So. Go to the Rockefeller Institute on Google. It should be there, and you'll get a lot of information or sign up on our, our mailing list. Um, again, uh, a big uh, honor to have you all here today. I think it was a very important uh, conversation to have, and we look forward to future conversations. Thank you very much for coming today. To retain funding for some program, we're actually going to hold you accountable for actual meaningful improvement in the lives of children in this state and this country, and that's the measure of whether or not you're effective or not. I think if we get to that point, from an advocacy standpoint, um, I think politicians and government officials like me, maybe it's easy for me to say because I've got like two and a half weeks left, um, <laughs> but I just think at the end of the day, we, we let our, our elected officials off too easily, and we let, let um, people like me off too easily by generally saying that if we commit dollars to a program, that that's good enough. I think this is a problem that has such deep systemic effects on our society um, and we need to do a better job of it. it it's complex it's not going to be solved overnight but if we continue to just focus purely on the money on the dollars on the resources and the programs and not on the outcomes I think we're going to do ourselves a tremendous disservice we could see sitting in this room 20 years from now looking at the same bad outcomes um, and that would be a real shame thank you Jason <laughs> You sound like you're two weeks out with that speech. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Commissioner Elia. Gonna you're going to come up. Um, I feel like I've been swinging my head too much since we have two real rooms here that we're really um, talking about. Um, so, so I um, echo kind of, I think, the frustration I hear in Jason's voice um, and realize, um, having been in, in education now for 50 years, that um, the real problem is in the adults in the room who can't seem to break down the, the approach that has been the way we do it. Okay? And so if you think about it, and it's not just in education, because clearly we own part of that, but it's in all the social programs, it's in all the health programs, it's all across the, the full array of uh, partners that don't really get good at being a partner. And I can say that in the fact that it has been very difficult to have everyone see that we all need to be on the same page in changing these things and the processes that go into how we establish the rules. 
So let me say, I think that um, New York has done some really good work in getting to the fringe of these issues. And I'm going to mention a few of them. Some of them have to do with the work the regents are doing. Some of them have to do with the work that, um, that our governor has led um, and our legislators have supported. And some of it has to do with the work that, that's coming out of the Department of Health. But nobody's really gotten everything together yet. And I think that's the real issue that we face. So from a perspective of what have we been doing with the regions and with education in New York, um, we've really looked at how we can support that early childhood um, time and even before what happens when a kid comes into a, a program for a three-year-old, What's happened before then? So the regents just had and worked um, diligently with a group of people, probably many of you were part of that work, on um, the Blue Ribbon Early Childhood um, work group that we had. We came out with a number of, of regu uh, regulation changes. We have some of those, but um, recommendations that we really feel will make a shift in how we do things, like training our early childhood and supporting those teachers in early childhood so that they know how to do the kinds of things that Jack identified as critical in terms of developing relationships and working with children that are very young. We also made recommendations and for our students with disabilities specifically to have chronological children with students who have been identified early by their pediatricians as developmentally delayed being in, in programs together and working with the outcomes in those programs are much, much better for children who have developmental delays that have been identified earlier. So we have some agendas that we are moving forward on. I would say to you that it was a breakthrough, um, and I appreciate Jason's work in this area and all of the people that helped us. Um, we've got some great supporters for the work um, of our 1,000 days um, on Medicaid, and how, how is it we're going to move the agenda? Um, just walking in the room from education's perspective was a big deal for us. Because um, some of you know that had not happened before and it was really an important part of this because I think it helped people to see that we are really, we have to be part of it, own it, but not own it all. And we have to partner with people. Um, so that I think is a really critical part of this, that um, we know that what happens before a child goes into a program for a three-year-old or a four-year-old and what happens in the communities that are serving those children beforehand. Do they get the kind of supports that are necessary when it's identified by their pediatrician early that they have some of these issues? Or more importantly, as Jack pointed out, the family and the supports that need to go into family. One of the things that I would say that has been um, extremely supportive of the work that we um, in education and I think in our schools across the state are doing relates to the whole idea of community schools. So um, the governor um, pushed a program, supported um, and put funding in place for community schools to be established across the state. And so we've, we've spent now through this year, over $200 million to support community schools who really, I think, um, are one of the things that we need to say ultimately is going to move us in the direction of looking at families and the families and the importance that they have in a child's life. And so providing social and emotional supports for kids in school and most importantly for their families is a really critical piece of that. So as we've moved forward, some of these agendas that Jack identified as really a critical piece, I think we're starting to move that direction. But we still have rules in place in all of the agencies that interact with families and kids <coughs> that don't support each other. The rules, right? The regulations that say you can't do this, and then you say, well, that's really going to hurt a kid that's in foster care. What are we going to do about that? And so I think the critical piece is that we have this on our plate now, 
Um, I'm sorry you're leaving, Jason, but we will keep you in the loop. Um, but I think just making sure that we all realize the critical nature of working together and get the adults in the room where they need to be. One of the most difficult things I've seen in my entire career is getting people who are in a position to make the rules to think differently about making rules. Giving up part of the part of the power, if you will, that they have to be the one to make the rule and to not think, got to make sure everybody is on the page with me before I put this rule in place. So not only do we have, as we move forward, to think differently about how we do that, but we have to break down some of those barriers that we've been so good at putting in place, and I think that's the agenda that we have. And that's a difficult one, because I think many of the people who made the rules have strong personalities, and I'm one of them. But I think we have to accept the fact that we can't just move forward without partnership with each other. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time to come to New York, Jack. Stay with us. <laughs> Dr. Briggs, do you want to go from there or from the podium? Your choice. I think you're right in okay. terms of being able to see that other room of folks and not have my back to them, so I will. Um, thank you. Three hard acts to follow, but I'll do my best to actually bring it back down to things that are happening on the ground. Um, I am a child psychologist by training, and I was always focused on the early years of life because I'm young enough to have gone to graduate school when we started to actually learn some things about how profoundly important it was to get it right in terms of brain development in the early years of life. So I go to the Bronx because that seems like we've got some risk factors in the Bronx, and I want to help that, and I work in an early childhood mental health clinic. And so we see children in that clinic from birth to five. And you say, wow, how preventive. And I say, not if that four-year-old comes in with four years of exposure to domestic and community violence. That's a four-year-old that will absolutely get kicked out of pre-K. It's a four-year-old that is absolutely on their way to significant health problems, as Jack had outlined. And it's about as far from prevention as you can get. When I would talk to families and say, you know, this has been going on for four years and you only just came here now, because if you have a four-year-old or you know anyone with a four-year-old, think about what it would take to bring them to a shrink's office. It takes a lot. Things have to have gotten really bad. And I said, have you spoken to anyone about any of this before you came to me? And they would almost always say, yes, I told the pediatrician. I said, who are these pediatricians, and how do I go find some of them? <laughs> because it seems to me that's where I should be, rather than in this building that nobody wants to go to unless things have gotten really, really bad. So lo and behold, um, I went to meet these pediatricians, and I learned a few extraordinary things about the pediatric platform in this country. And when I say pediatric, I do include family medicine and nurse practitioners, any medical provider who sees children. Number one, it's the most universally accessed system that we have in this country for young children. Depending on the data that you look at, upwards of 90 to 95 percent of children in this country have a regular medical home where they receive care. We don't have any other system like that. Number two, people like to say that it's, it's non-stigmatized. I'd go even one further and say it's positively stigmatized. Almost no matter your cultural or your ethnic background, you're a good parent if you take your child to the pediatrician. Number three, people trust their pediatrician. It's extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> when they do those surveys, right, and they say, who do you trust? Way up top are pediatricians and nurses and clergy. People trust their pediatricians. And number four, and perhaps most importantly, and this is the thing that I think a lot of us don't really think about, speaking to the two-generation aspect of this work and how critically important it is, it was no good for me to try to fix that four-year-old and send him back into a family where there were significant risk factors. You want to know where young parents are, especially young mothers, especially new mothers? You want to know the only place you can find them? Pediatrics. They're not going for their own health care, and we know that. 
That's a separate problem in a separate meeting, right? But even with significant risk factors and all sorts of things going on and massive amounts of stress and difficulty getting out of the house, they will take that child to that well child visit because they have to. They know they need to. They know it's what's best for the child. They know they have to in order to keep their Medicaid, right? To get WIC, to get a lot of the services. And our most at-risk families come to pediatrics. And they don't just come once. They come all the time. You may not remember, but if you have a child who's uh, in the first three years of life, you come 13 times to the pediatrician's office. And that's if everything's perfectly healthy and well and wonderful. What an extraordinary platform, positively stigmatized, almost universally accessed, trusted, two-generation in nature. Nobody's dropping their two-year-old off at the pediatrician for the day, right? And yet, the integration of behavioral health and of parent-child work into pediatrics still remains the exception rather than the rule. We started our program in Montefiore in 2005. That was 13 years ago by my count. At the time, we were unique in doing it. And I hate to tell you that right now, we are still unique in doing it. But I would say that in the last decade plus, the conversation has changed a little bit. And that's due to the work of Jack and other wonderful folks that we lean on. So that I'm not so much answering the why question anymore. Like, why put mental health specialists in pediatrics? Everyone kind of gets that now, right? You put mental health specialists in pediatrics because it's a non-stigmatized setting where you can deliver parent-child behavioral health services and nobody even notices, right? What I mean by nobody notices is they don't feel like you referred them to the social worker, right? But now the questions that we're asking is how, Right? And everyone is saying, OK, I get it why we do this, but how do we do this? And the how is complicated for a couple of reasons. One is workforce development, right? Again, another meeting. But for this meeting, I'd say the biggest, um, the biggest roadblock in implementing programs like this is that we don't have a system to pay for prevention. Our mental health system is predicated on paying for problems. If you have a diagnosis of depression, you, will, you, know, you can treat that and the provider gets paid. If we do our job right within the Healthy Steps program within primary care, these kids never have a diagnosis of depression. And that's not to say there weren't significant risk factors that had they gone untreated would have probably potentially resulted in depression, but that's a harder argument to make on the quality side, and I'm not pretending it's not, right? It's much easier to say to the Medicaid office, listen, I'll drop this you know, screening score 50%. I'll take this group of people who used to be super high at risk on this screening scale, well, maybe it was for depression, and I'll drop it by 50%, right? That's easier. What I'm saying is, no, no, I'm gonna take this group of kids who have significant risk factors. We're in the Bronx where about 50% of our neighborhoods are living in pretty extreme poverty, right? And what we're going to do with these kids is they're never going to have those diagnoses. They're never going to have depression, anxiety. Their asthma is going to be better managed. They're going to be less obese, right? Why? How can we impact obesity with parent-child, early childhood work in, in primary care? Because obesity in early childhood is largely, when it's not a congenital issue, a factor of the parent-child relationship and of stress in the environment, right? So we're going to get these, these outcomes of positive health, of good mental health, by using this universally accessed platform in pediatrics. But if we don't figure out a way to start paying for this, it's going to remain the exception rather than the rule. For some other thing that we had to do the other day, I, was, I had someone in my office and I said to her, do me a favor, get out the calculator, I'm going to read you a bunch of numbers and add all these numbers up. And she said, all right. Um, so she's adding the numbers up and the, and the number gets to 10 million and a little bit. And that's the amount of grant funding that we've had to raise since 2005 to 2018 at Montefiore to make this program work. And I'm very grateful that we've been able to do it, but that we can't ask all of our systems around the state to do that same thing. We need to figure out a way to pay for prevention, to recognize the extraordinary platform that is the pediatric practice, to really get to families prenatally, postnatally, and in a two-generation way. We need to work our... As
short as we can so that we're not sending four-year-olds to pre-K with the amount of risk factors that we saw. Um, and I would, I would close by saying that I think, you know, as you heard, I took on this new job February 1st to be the National Director of Healthy Steps, but I stayed at Montefiore in the Bronx one day a week. Why? I don't know. In retrospect, it makes my life really challenging. <laughs> um, but Jack actually was giving me good advice along the way to make sure that I did that. And my heart is still in New York, and I think that we have an extraordinary opportunity in this state to get things right, to have participated on the first thousand days on Medicaid work group, to have Mary Ellen and her, and her group be part of that, to see sort of the place-based cross-sector work that's going on in Albany, and to think about how we spread this across this extraordinary state is reason enough to go to the Bronx on Wednesdays. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, and I think now we have time for questions. That was great, thank you. I'd like to start with the first question and then leave it to my panelists, fellow panelists to ask questions and open up to the audience. And I think Dr. Briggs got right to it, the how question. It sounds great if you take Jack's theory. There are a lot of players. We have the education sort of sector and the medical, uh, the health sector here. But you all just raised social services and criminal justice. There are a lot of agencies. and the commissioner said, and people don't like to naturally give up power. So how do you make this theory of collective activity with, we have a lot of policy people and governmental people here just on the local level trying to make things work. How do you make it work and stick while also building in some room for trial and error, right? Because not always these things work. And how do you convince policymakers that sometimes it may not always work, but the investment of the process itself is a worthwhile investment because you'll eventually get it right. So I'll leave that how question. Maybe, Jack, since you're, you know, you're still got the Brooklyn and Bron Bronx accent, we'll turn over to you first. So let me tell you. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's funny. I, I know very few people in the room, but every time I come back to New York, I feel safe, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to take a chance and kind of be really straight about this. I, so if if we start with what science is telling us, um, everything about development and health is ad adaptation. We adapt to the environment. Babies growing up in tough circumstances um, have a lot of things that are happening to their bodies that are not good in the long run, but they're necessary for short-term survival. So it's all about adaptation. So I, let me put two ideas on the table. One is, I mean, I think the power of, of this group and this panel and the science is that this notion of collective efficacy or building relationships um, and cross-agency agreements, for a long time it's been based on the kind of the politics of, of figuring out where people could get together. Um, so guess what? There's one science that everybody can feed off right now. You know, and part of the problem of bringing agencies together is they have the different ways of thinking. People have been trained in a different way. They kind of use different language. They have different measures. And that's really kind of like a little bit of a UN kind of thing. Get everybody together on a big issue, but everybody thinks differently. If everybody's interested in, in leveraging the science, it's the same science for health, for learning, it's the same science for kids with special needs as it is for kids growing up in wealthy, highly educated families as it is for kids who are in poor families. It's the same basic science. So we've seen in some states where we've worked, um, having everybody come to the table and look at the same science together changes the conversation. It's less about territory and it's more about how each of us could feed off this same knowledge base. It's a different conversation. Um, but I'm gonna kind of up the ante a little bit here on the adaptation issue. and. What do I have to lose? So I'll get on the plane at the end of the day, and you'll never invite me back, but no. But seriously, I think everybody in one way or other touched on the issue of, of outcomes, and kind of let's, let's get more serious about the outcomes that matter, okay? Well, for a long time, the early childhood field could not afford to get serious about the outcomes that matter, because there was always an existential threat about whether you'd kind of be in existence next year, right? So. Um, and there were enough things to measure. And also, there were enough good things going on in programs. There were plenty of programs having a big impact on lots of kids, so you could always gather data. And everybody who's ever had a grant-funded project or program who had one renewal knows how to write a progress report. 
that shows that you made a difference. So that's, that's adaptation. Um, and that's no, longer, that, that's no good anymore. And I know this is where I think, I go back to my pediatric roots. I've been kind of out of pediatrics for a while, and I've been calling myself a recovering pediatrician, and now I'm calling myself a born-again pediatrician because I'm, com <laughs> I'm coming back. I'm coming back because I think the future of early childhood, just as Rahel said and everyone else, I think, the f I think early childhood as a, as a field um, does not have a good future unless there's a big grounding in the healthcare system. It, it can't survive uh, with the way policies and funding streams go on just the poor backs of the child care programs. It's not, it's not that they're not critical, but they've got, it has to be anchored to a system that has more stability and more funding. So if you think about what it's like in medicine, you know, you kind of, when you start out and you're a pediatrician, Kids come in with varieties of questions and needs and problems, and some you can fix and some you can't. And there are some diseases where you make a diagnosis and you've got a treatment, and it's easy to do it, and it's easy to see the result. And there are some where you, the treatments are just, they're, they're, they're helping, but they're not what everybody wants. And nobody says, well, gee, you know, you guys have been working on these diseases for a long time. And you haven't come up with an answer. So I don't think we should do this anymore. I don't think we should give you money to do this. And nobody in the healthcare system says, well, you know, this disease, we can't treat it that well. But the parents like coming here. <laughs> and, and we have high satisfaction levels. And, um, and, um, and, yeah, and, and the parents are reading to their kids more. Um, and so not that they're not healthier, but they're reading to the kids more. So we, I think to be in a position of saying that, that we're going to get tougher on ourselves, on outcomes, is a sign of a healthy field. It's a, a sign of a field that's struggling to survive, is to grasp at measuring whatever you can to write a good progress report. We're too healthy for that right now. This field is too strong, and this science is too strong to continue to not confront um, areas where we're not happy with what we're achieving and where we are happy. And that, the reason for that is because at the end of the day, it's about the kids doing better. It's not, and I think as everybody said, it's not just about getting money for programs, but you can't help if we don't have money for programs. So I'm not in any way diminishing the critical challenges for advocacy for funding. But um, nobody, and I'll channel, I think, what you said, Jason. So for me, one of the things I say is that um, there's got, there have to be some things that are state-of-the-art right now that 10 or 15 years from now some that we'll be laughing at. Can you believe what we were doing in 2018? Because look what we're doing now. And we can't say that a lot about what we did 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago. And that's a problem. So I, I think we should embrace the challenge of, of raising the bar as a sign of how healthy this field is, how strong its knowledge base is. And this is not just rhetoric, because I know we've been working with programs in different parts of the country. And I have found that when you bring program developers and evaluators and practitioners together with parents, um, it, the practitioners get on fire. They say, I've never had a chance to stop and think what I'm doing. I've never had a chance to kind of interact with other people. I think that's a big antidote to burnout, is to not have people say, we know what to do. It's just we're not getting money. But to say, we know what to do in some cases. We don't have answers in others. We're going to figure this out. So I think, the, for me, the outcomes have become the issue, and it's not the holy grail. It's what works for whom, and why, and what doesn't, and what are we going to do differently. So I, I didn't mean to make a speech about okay. that, but that's, I think that's really um, where the field needs to go next. We're too healthy to just keep um, finding whatever we can find and declaring victory. Uh, I would add on that, on top of that, for what Jack just said, was that I think at the end of the day, in this area, we need to clearly identify what are the measures that we care the most about. We need to benchmark it. And then what we need to do is, as policymakers, think about what we could do to create a structure that brings accountability, but also greater flexibility so that um, there's opportunities for innovation, and innovations particularly at a local level. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is, is that government, by its nature, tends to want to one size fits all, almost anything it does. Um, and, um, and we also sometimes, on the ultra of evidence-based, sometimes try to replicate uh, programs in ways that aren't actually meeting the needs of individuals in a particular community. And we also, I think, sometimes assume that just because a program is evidence-based, that just that if it's implemented, that it will in fact work, or that it will work for all children. I mean, it can be an evidence-based program, but frankly, folks, it can be implemented amazingly poorly 
and it can be a complete failure. Or it can work exceptionally well for certain children, but be a total waste of money and not the right solution for, for others. And I think, you know, play off Jack's point a little bit too, is, is that my attacking away from programs and services and things towards outcomes allows us to put less and, and put the, the programs themselves less on a pedestal. Um, because once something is up there on a pedestal, it's evidence-based and everyone thinks it's great, we run the risk that as the science advances, as, as knowledge uh, develops, that we run the risk that we lock ourselves into those previous proposals that at some point or another, and healthcare is a good example, it can take a decade for what the science suggests is the most appropriate treatment for something to become almost universally or very commonly utilized to treat a yeah, condition. Length of time is 17 years. Seven, 17 yeah. years. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and, 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 every t and that's why I think in some cases in, in this field as in others is that if we can rely, le focus less on the thing that we're going to do and more on the outcome and encourage, empower, support local innovation, particularly in something as complex as what we're talking about here that requires that cross sector collaboration, I think that would be a major step forward. And I'll give you like one, one theoretical example of, of how this could be done. Can you imagine you took a population, you said, here are the performance measures that we really care about. We baseline those measures across that population. We say we want to improve those metrics over a multi-year period, incremental improvements, and we're going to measure. We're also going to invest new money into strategies evidence-based, but give flexibility at a very local level to tailor those strategies over time to best meet the needs of the population. Is real accountability because the payments these organizations, these local efforts receive is directly linked to outcomes. If you succeed, you get paid. If you don't, you don't get paid. That is accountability mixed with flexibility. That is not a theoretical construct. That is the delivery system reform incentive payment program in New York. Whether people supported the concept of how we went about transforming health delivery or not, that construct to me can and should be replicated in other places. We should look to, instead of investing in one or two specific initiatives, put monies into communities, give those communities flexibility, but with that flexibility comes accountability. Benchmark current performance and say, you know what, over a three to five year period, we actually want to see the needle move. Not in unrealistic, unachievable ways, but in meaningful ways that actually shows that things are working. We need to employ rapid cycle continuous improvement in the things that have been deployed in other sectors of our economy very successfully so that when you get on an airplane, you are highly confident that airplane, even if it's Cape Air and there has one pilot, is <laughs> going to land at its destination. That was not by accident that we had basically in the United States and developed world eliminated airplane crashes as something that happens. That was over time, over and over again, figuring out why those amazingly complex systems, machines, what caused them to fail and what could be done to prevent those things. If we took that kind of rigor and applied that to challenges like what we're talking about here, where the stakes are so high, that'd be amazingly powerful. But I think you have to create that construct Empower train support is one of the things that the, the institute that Nancy Zimfer is leading is potentially so important. That's why the, the partnership here in Albany and, the, and those other collective impact efforts that bring the rigor of, of uh, route cycle continuous improvement, lean-like strategies, and bring those kind of approaches within the right overall policy context, um, we could unleash a type of entrepreneurship, creativity, uh, and progress uh, that I think would be uh, wonderful. And I think that's when we'll see meaningful progress that not only benefits the people where it's happening, but can also be significantly replicated. <laughs> Commissioner Rahel? Uh, why don't we go yeah, to some other questions? Sure. Maybe we can get to the, the groups. Kind yeah, of sense. I think yeah, we have, I a have three really quick points, I promise. So to Jack's first point about you know not being satisfied um, with parental satisfaction right as an outcome, take mental health and look at you know the success rate of referring people to mental health services out in the community. 
When we identify people with mental health problems and we try to connect them with the mental health system, fewer than half of those people ever get connected to the service system we've designed to treat their problem. Mm -hmm. If that was cancer, we'd all be up in arms. We have a cancer hospital and only half of the people with cancer go to the cancer hospital and the rest are like talking to their grandma? We would never, never stand for that. But with mental health, somehow we stand for it. Once you integrate it into primary care, you solve for that problem. The second small point I wanted to make is this idea about variability. The beauty of, of bringing in behavioral health into primary care is you have all sorts of kinds of problems. You can solve about 75% of them within the primary care setting. They're mild to moderate enough. But some are really severe, and you need to then lean on that specialty mental health care system in a different way. But it's the addition of a new member into your primary care team because of what Jack said before. The pediatrician, you, we can't just keep asking pediatricians to do more. We can't say to the pediatrician, can you now become an early childhood parent-child mental health specialist in your so spare time? They're not trained to do that. They're not trained. No, exactly. Right? Um, and then to my final point, I would say that we found in some of our early outcomes that we made no difference for families where um, parents didn't have any trauma in their childhood. When we compared to same, you know, we gave the same service to two groups um, and we looked at outcomes and social emotional development of the child was our outcome of interest. And we saw that we made this profound difference compared to their match control group when mom had had significant trauma in her background. You give them this program and you get a real big difference. But if mom didn't have any trauma in her childhood, we didn't make much difference. The kids didn't look much different than those control group kids. And that's the kind of data we need to be talking about more and publish more so that we don't just say we need to give out this, we need to give home visiting to every kid in New York. No, we don't. And by the way, it would bankrupt us. <laughs> yeah. That's not going to be Jason's problem. In two weeks. <laughs> I'd like to open, we have like 15 minutes or so, I'd like to open it up uh, to the audience, uh, some questions. That we have a gentleman.